Okay, so this is, uh, you're going to get me on the screen the whole time. So whoever's watching, hello, and thank you for joining me. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. If you've never heard of me or what I do, um, I've actually been around for a long time. And I am following in my dad's footsteps, as that lovely little intro uh, mentioned. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I was actually born in 1961. So I grew up in this era where um, modern women were getting all these processed foods to make life easier, like Hamburger help, Helper and all of these, you know, a lot of fast foods came in, but my parents didn't let us partake of any of that. We grew up in rural Idaho and we grew up on a, a big acre of land and we had huge gardens and there were 14 kids in my family. So that alone just kind of made us different um, in, a, in a really big, beautiful way because we've still stayed close as siblings, just all the things that we learned growing up. And when you're in a family that big, the skills that you get are really different. But the cool thing about the way we were raised too is that the, my dad was a medicinal botanist. So his PhD was literally in making medicine out of plants. And he grew up in a family of five boys and two girls, and all of his siblings went into their parents' um, heating and plumbing and electrical business, except for my dad. And when we were growing up, my dad would uh, take us not just on nature walks and teach us about plants, but like if we were driving somewhere, uh, and I have this vi these vivid memories of like driving to church, we're all piled in the car, my dad would see a plant on the side of the road that he would want to teach us about. He would pull over, we'd all pile out, and he would say, okay, this is, you can use the flowers, you can use the stem, this part of the plant, you'd use the leaves or the root, and, and he would identify it for us. And he would tell us the botanical name, the Latin name, what the common names were, what time of day you collect it. And sometimes we would collect different plants, not just where we were driving, but we would purposefully go up into uh, the mountains and we would we would do this. This was normal for us as kids. So uh, I'm second oldest of all of my siblings. And so it was kind of like one of those things where um, it, it's, I guess it's not really surprising I carried on his work, but my dad actually passed away uh, 25 years ago, he was actually very young. And I just had my 62nd birthday and my dad was 62 when he passed away. So it was kind of a bittersweet birthday uh, because it was like, you know, my dad was so young. He was so impactful in the world of herbal medicine. You know, he used to lecture at Bastyr. In fact, when I was in high school, uh, I brought a cop. I have a copy of his book right here. Some if, if, if people have been geeking out over herbal medicine, this is a book my dad wrote more than 40 years ago. It's called From the Shepherd's Purse. And um, I remember when he saw publish this book, and it still has an impact to this day because the properties of herbal medicine and mother nature don't really change. And there's a consistency in what plant medicine brings to us. So my dad wrote this book. He had this amazing um, career of working with, with um, incredible people. He spent 30 years studying with E.T. Krebs Jr. And he worked with Renee Casey, who was the, uh, she developed a formula that's, that's been around for a hundred years now. That's an anti-cancer formula. He worked with her. He worked with uh, Dr. Holda Clark, which if anybody has been studying and researching and is familiar with herbal medicine, these are some names that you might be familiar with. But this was just my dad. He was always had his hands in plants. There were pots growing all over our house. Uh, there was like huge gardens. We were, there were always things curing in jars on the counter. I mean, it was just, it was very, very normal to us. And then I think what happened as we, I know this happened for me for sure. As we started getting older, we're like, oh my gosh, our parents are so hippie. Uh, we just really are not that interested in, you know, you know, we all, all, all my siblings and I, we went through a pretty good phase in our twenties of fast food, junk food. Um, you know, a lot of us experimented with, a, with stuff that's available in modern society that we didn't get to partake of, uh, as 
kids and teenagers. So, you know, my youngest brother just turned, uh, he'll be 41 this year. So we're, we're all adults now. And it's like, we've all come back. We've all come back to this natural way of not just taking care of ourselves, but our families and our kids. And, you know, I have a couple of grandkids now and it has been such a beautiful gift to be able to pass on this deep, rich history and knowledge that my dad passed on. So one of the things that my dad is was very well known for, and we're still well known for uh, at this point, is um, a plant called lomatium. And if anybody's watching this that is familiar with what with what I do, carrying on my dad's work, um, then this this is something that you might be familiar with. Now, a lot of people have never heard of this plant uh, because it only grows in the wild and it's never been successfully cultivated. So you can't get a bunch of seeds and, and cultivate it. It's even actually a little bit difficult to cultivate in the, uh, in the land where it, it grows wild. Um, and it only grows in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So you can't, uh, you have to know where to get it. You have to know how to identify it because the time of the day um, the time of year you collect it is in the late fall. And that's when all the properties are the highest and all of the properties of the plant are concentrated in the root. So you do need to know how to identify it and then how to harvest the root. Now, Lomatium, um, its name is Lomatium dissectum. And then the variation is Multifida because there are different species of the plant, Lomatium. Uh, Lomatium is what's known as a broad spectrum antimicrobial. And what I have found, and this is after not just my research, my dad's research. Um, and I, so I've been going for 21 years. My dad's been gone 25 and I've been going on my own for 21. But after all of the things that I've seen, a lot of the doctors and herbalists that I have collaborated with, this is, I think it's most powerful antimicrobial property is antiviral. So it not only covers a broad range of viruses, but uh, candida, yeast, certain types of fungus, and also some types of bad bacteria. So if you think about a plant that's um, that covers those kinds of things, you know, I have a, um, my parents adopted three Native, Native American children. So they had 11 and they adopted three. And my brother, my Native American brother, when he was adopted when he was two, and he's now 59. So um, we're, we're in this range, but he's really dived back into his Native American indigenous people's roots. You know, he's done a ton of genealogy, a ton of research. And he said that the Native Americans called this the panacea. Lomatium is the panacea because it covers so many things. In fact, I will tell people on a regular basis, if I could only pick one plant to take me through this life, it would be Lomatium, but just because of the things that it covers. And if you think about the things that come at us as far as virus and fungus and different microbes, it's not that we want to eradicate them. We want to give our immune system and our body the ability to adapt so that the viruses that come at us can just make our not only our immune system strong, our microbiome, our virome, all the things that live inside our body and help us get stronger. But Lomatium is one of those plants that can really help you. Um, you know, I've used, get over almost anything that is in, has some type of infection. And that is a big, bold thing to say, but this is lots of research and lots of personal use. In fact, what I find is the older that I get, the easier it is for me to say, this is what I've used it for. This is what I've used it for. My grandkids use it for this. And I use it on my kids when they were, you know, when using this for this infection or this, whatever. In fact, you know, when COVID hit, um, I was, I was kind of like, okay, you know, I had this tool chest of not just the Lomatium, but a whole tool chest of herbal tinctures and herbal salves and all the things that I know how to make um, myself and use in my own family. So I, I think that Lomatium is definitely something that people could take a look at. Now I would compare it to something like uh, chaparral, oil of oregano, 
um, you know, different antimicrobials that, that some people might get used to using. Um, echinacea is a good one. Echinacea, I feel like is more um, like wound healing, immune system, stimulates immune system. But if you want a really heavy hitter, uh, lomatium is, is one of those things. Now, one of the things I also love for um, uh, going after infections is OSHA, OSHA root. And it has a real affinity for the lungs and infections and things that tend to sit in the lungs. Same with like lobelia and mullen. These are the kind of things that are really, really good for infections in the lungs. Now there is something about lomatium that we do everything we can to educate people on because um, this can be a little bit of a scary thing, even though if you understand it, it, it loses all its scare power. So there's about 10% of the people who use Lomation for the first time that will get a full body one-time detox rash. And all of the years that I've been going on my own, and even all the years that my dad was around, I have seen thousands and thousands of rashes at this point. And it's very, very um, predictable the way it comes on. So what we find is if someone starts using Lomation, then uh, it's usually between days five and seven that they will that they will break out in this detox rash. And it is for most people head to toe, full body rash. But it's but like I said, it is very predictable. And the fact that it doesn't come on on the first day, um, that that shows you that it's not an allergic reaction because I'll have people that will be like, this looks exactly like an allergic reaction. Um, it you know it kind of has a measles type of look, and there's a whole a um, period of time where there's kind of a little bit of it get, getting worse before it gets better. And what I have come to believe is that if your body finally has a tool to eradicate a viral load, so think about something like Epstein-Barr, um, 95% of the world, their, the population of the world has some type of Epstein-Barr, shingles, herpes, mono, all of these live under the umbrella of Epstein-Barr. And for the most part, a lot of us just live with it um, because our bodies have adapted. And unless we have high moments of stress, because as you know, like a herpes outbreak or a shingles outbreak break is brought on by high levels of stress, then our body, or if we say we've had a ton of antibiotics, um, we maybe are on a lot of medications, we don't have a clean diet, we don't, we don't meditate, we don't get out in nature. We don't do things to help our, our body stay grounded to the earth, which is the story for most modern humans, um, or at least modern people in the Western world for sure. But if you, what, what I found is when people finally get a tool to eradicate a viral load, and this actually happened to my own husband, and I'll tell you that story in one second, but I believe that their body now has this tool and your liver, which is a which is a one of your major detox organs, is not prepared or maybe healthy enough for some people because it doesn't happen to everybody. But they're not it, your liver's not healthy enough to handle how fast this detox comes, and your skin as your largest organ is simply helping you out, which is such a beautiful gift. So at, at about day five to seven, the rash will typically show up. Uh, for a lot of people where they were having a problem. So say someone has a thyroid problem, whether it's hypo or hyper, and they've been dealing with, you know, Epstein-Barr, like Epstein-Barr is, is a lot of causes will cause, will cause a lot of problems with your thyroid. Well, the rash will show up for those people right here first where your thyroid is, and then it will spread. People who have chronic kidney infections or urinary tract infections, the rash will show up on their low back near the area where their kidneys are. Um, people that have chronic chest infections, rash will show up here. I've had many, many people have the rash start on their stomach. If they've had, you know, candida and infections that just tend to maybe settle in the intestinal tract and, and whatever. I mean, I've seen rashes uh, start on almost any part of the body. The least common place are your extremities but that's typically where it ends. So the rash will start wherever it'll spread and then it will go finish out on the extremities and it is itchy. It's uncomfortable. 
Um, and for some people, it is a little bit scary because I think as modern humans, we are not used to the body going through a healing crisis um, on its way to getting well.